Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you as you gather with us today for this lunchtime Eucharist service. As we gather here at the cathedral, we do so on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and to Indigenous people engaging with our live stream today. With me today here at the service are our Dean, uh, the very Reverend Dr. Andreas Lever, who will be preaching, and our Canon Missioner, uh, the Canon Robert Vaughan, uh, he'll be reading for us and leading prayers. And my name is Heather Pataka, I'm the presenter of the cathedral. Our service booklet is available on our website if you'd like to follow along with that or if you have to hand an APBA prayer book, you're welcome to join us by uh, turning to page 168. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, thank you, Stuart. My apologies, everyone. I've gone to stand in the wrong place to begin the service. Our prayer of the week. God, our Father, who, whose will it is to bring all things to order and unity in our Lord Jesus Christ, may all the peoples of the world, now divided and torn apart by sin, be brought together under his sovereign rule of love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, do please take a seat, won't you, as uh, Canon Robert reads to us from the Bible. A reading from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is, the, it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. Hear the word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 27, verses 11 to 14. This can be found on page 247 of the Prayer Book for Australia. We say together, Do not hide your face from me, or thrust your servant aside in displeasure. For you have been my helper. Do not cast me away or forsake me, O God of my salvation. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in an even path, for they lie in wait for me. Would you please stand, if you're able, for our Gospel reading. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And he turned and he said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes to him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Take a seat, please. In the verses immediately preceding this afternoon's gospel reading, Jesus had taught large crowds about God's extravagant love and God's generous hospitality. God's kingdom was like a huge feast where there wasn't just abundant food, but also plenty of places at the table. There was, in fact, so much room that God had to send out more people to fill each seat. God is generous, and God's kingdom is a place of great hospitality. All people are invited by God, Jesus tells in these stories. But every person needs to accept for themselves the invitation to celebrate with God. And each one of us does so by herself or himself. The invitation is a matter between the individual and God. It cuts right across any other ties that we might already have. And that may help us a little bit to understand the rather harsh language and distinction that's being made in this afternoon's gospel. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple, Jesus tells the crowds that had been so attracted by his teaching about God's generous invitation and hospitality. In order to follow Jesus, we need to put Jesus before anyone, before anything else. Jesus comes first, and those who he entrusts us to care for and to care for us. Following Jesus is very much a personal decision. When we think about Christ's call to us, when we reflect on whether we ought to answer the invitation to discipleship, we do that each on our own, not as part of a family not as part of a partnership. Each one of us needs to take the decision to follow Jesus as an individual. That's why in our epistle reading, St. Paul says that there's only so much that he can do in order to help every individual Philippian to make up their minds about their discipleship. Following God, both to will and work for God, is ultimately a decision each one of us is called to make for ourselves, Paul says. He hopes that he might not have labored in vain, but he's unable to make the decision to follow Christ on our behalf. Each person who ponders Christ's invitation to follow him will need to consider carefully whether the call to discipleship is for them. In our epistle reading, Paul exhorts us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. In all the stories of Jesus calling people to follow him, we see how Jesus leaves people room to make a genuine decision. Those whom he calls are each given the opportunity to either accept or to reject that invitation. They're given space either to follow or to realize that Jesus is not for them. And choosing to reject Jesus' invitation is a fair response to Jesus' call because not all people will follow even though all are called. If having their lives turned upside down by Jesus, if having their ties of relationships and occupation disrupted by Jesus is not for them, is not for you, then people, then you, 
need not follow Jesus. But those who do accept Jesus' call need to put Jesus above all, our gospel reading tells us. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Disciples are followers, followers who love the one who calls. When we become followers of Jesus, we love Jesus first. And in the same binary pattern that underlies so much of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, when we love one thing, we cannot also love another thing. We're reduced to hating that which has been ranked second. If we follow Jesus, we love Jesus. And that means we cannot love any other relationships. We cannot follow any other masters. We cannot follow any other beliefs. And when we don't love someone, we hate them, our gospel tells us. You cannot be my disciple and not hate our family, our own life. And the reason why we hate all secondary relationships, our gospel reading implies, is because those relationships are not mediated by Jesus. This saying would have been just as hard to hear in Jesus' time as it is today, hating our families, our life. And I'd like to call on one of my heroes of faith, the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, to help us think about what hating the world may mean in practical terms for our day-to-day living. This is what Bonhoeffer offers us. If anyone or any ideology prevents us from standing as individuals before Christ, responding individually to his call, then we need to make a decision to turn to or to turn away from Christ. And when we truly turn to Christ, then we need to shun those who claim to be alternative mediators. And that is what hating the world means. At each step of the way, we assess what it is we face and whether that brings us closer to Christ or whether that leads us away from him. Our epistle reading echoes this. It calls our need to assess, to examine the world around us and the relationships which we forge in it, working out our own salvation in fear and trembling. It's a constant effort, our patron St. Paul acknowledges, to persist in choosing Christ in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. But when we accept Christ, when we let God work within us, when we do make the choice to follow in discipleship, and daily choose to abide in it, we are enabled both to will and to work for God's good pleasure. And there are tools that we are each given to enable us to choose Christ in our daily living, Paul tells us. Tools that help us choose God over and above the crookedness and the perversity that we see around us. And those tools are the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, the constancy of God's Word, and the personal sacrifices of each of our faiths. When we hold on to Christ, when we trust in his word and act in the power of his Holy Spirit, we disciples may shine like stars in the darkness, Paul tells. You and I might become like people by whom others may navigate their course through this world, much in the same way in which a master mariner, without a chart or a compass, is able to navigate the seas by orienting their ship's course according to the stars. When we love Christ and when we love him, we are also called to help others to enter into and experience that same love. Friends, God does call us to follow him and to enter into discipleship. He asks us to put him first in our lives and to assess the world around us in terms of that principal relationship, that primary love. And that sacrifice and that offering of faith is costly, our reading tells us. At the same time, our readings also assure us that when we follow in discipleship, we'll receive infinitely more than that what we have left behind. When Jesus' own disciples had come to him with the question of whether their own sacrifice had been of value, Jesus promised them that they would receive very much more in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. 
Each of us will invariably have to make sacrifices on our journeys of discipleship, on navigating through life and helping others to do the same. But a far greater value than our own sacrifice is the sacrifice of the one who loved us first and called us Jesus Christ, our readings affirm. Our sacrifice is an offering of faith, our epistle reading tells us. But Jesus' sacrifice is the free self-offering of his life, humbling himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, as Paul reminds us a few verses before today's epistle reading. In our lives of discipleship, we may be poured out as a libation, just as Jesus was, just as Paul was, but Jesus poured out his lifeblood as a sin offering for all, making himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. You and I will never be able to love our world in the way that Jesus did. We may never be able to empty ourselves in the way he did. There is no genuine love for this world except the love with which God has loved the world in Christ Jesus. But each one of us can choose to follow Christ and in our following to will and to work for God's good pleasure. Each one of us can choose to hear Jesus' call and to follow his example. Each one of us can share in shouldering the cross and the cost of discipleship, help carry the cross of the world's suffering and fear and follow in faith. And each of us can choose by our actions to reflect Christ's light in our lives so that others may steer their own course to safety and salvation because they see people like you and me shining like lights in our dark world. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the world and for the church. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ has promised that you will hear us when we ask in faith. Receive these prayers we offer to you today. We pray for strength to follow Jesus. Jesus said, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. We pray for the church for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Jeff, our primate, Philip, our Metropolitan Archbishop, for our Dean, the Cathedral Chapter, the Cathedral Ministry Team, and the Administrative Team. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus said, unless you change to become humble like little children, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven. We pray for our cathedral ministries and our members this time of restrictions, that we continue to be humble before God and to learn from him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus said, happy are the humble they will receive what God has promised. We pray for those who are suffering at this time because of the effects of COVID-19 and the restrictions. We pray for families that are separated, for people who have lost their jobs, for businesses who have suffered, and for those whose mental health has been affected. May your comfort and strength be with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus said, be merciful as your Father is merciful. Love your enemies and do good to them. We pray for peace in this world, this world that is so broken and divided. Pray for peace in Syria, Afghanistan. 
between Israel and Palestine, peace for Armenia and Azerbaijan, for Belarus, for Thailand, and also for a lot of Muslim countries. We pray for the Philippines that has just suffered another cyclone, for Vietnam and Cambodia, for Turkey that had just had an earthquake. May your mercy and grace be upon these nations. Assist and enable the leaders of these nations to bring about peace, healing, and rebuilding of their land. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus said, Love one another as I love you. There is no greater love than this, to lay down your life for your friends. We pray for those who have died especially for those who we know. Today, we especially remember Braden Grebel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus said, go to the people everywhere and make disciples of them, and I will be with you always to the end of time. We pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we will continue to be faithful to follow him as his disciple. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, you know us and love us, and hear our prayer. Keep us in the eternal fellowship of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup of the Lord, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat the bread and drink of the cup. Knowing the goodness of God and our failure to respond with love and obedience, let us confess our sins together, saying, Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, Enable us to live for you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion, forgiving all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. God therefore forgives you in Christ Jesus, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. We read in John chapter 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. And as the psalmist reminds us, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. 
For having made peace with God, we make peace with one another. I invite you to stand with me as we greet one another. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right to give our thanks and praise. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, making us in your own image. We praise you for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, gracious God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine, and we pray that we who receive them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit according to our Saviour's word, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may share his body and blood. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again, giving you thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We eat this bread and drink this cup to proclaim the death of the Lord. We do this until he returns. Come Lord Jesus. Father, as we recall his saving death and glorious resurrection, may we who share these gifts be renewed by your Holy Spirit and united in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, there to feast at your table and join in your eternal praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Draw near with faith to feed on Christ in your hearts with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are living members of Christ's body. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Well, I invite you to stand with me for our blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.